Yeah. Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So this is Ka Sing, Ka Sing Yu, uh, one of the co-curators co of the Venice Biennale 2021 Hong Kong Collateral Event uh, co-curator. And uh, I can't really remember um, uh, whether this is the, the eighth or the, the ninth webinar, but it has been quite a while since uh, our last one with Warha on Green Architecture. Yeah, so this one will be focusing really on our exhibit. Why? Because um, in fact, Venice Biennale has already been officially opened in Venice. Yeah, in Venice uh, on the 22nd of May. And so today we'll have two groups. Both have the video ex exhibits to present with us their design concepts, their design process, and of course, um, the takeaway that they want us to take away yeah, after after enjoying the exhibit and also video. Oh, I should not say that they're both videos. In fact, um, the first group, um, we have Kali from Andrew Lee King Fan. The group is actually creating an exhibit, a really big exhibit, but they have some videos to help to uh, elaborate on their design concept. Whereas we have Louis and also Polina from PolyU on their video, which is called Michael Redistribution. Yeah, CDU, right? CDU, yeah, micro distribution. Oh, and of course, Andrew Lee King Fund's video is called The Seat. Yeah, The Seat. Oh, hi, we have some guests, and we seldom have guests turning on their cameras, but we are, you're all welcome to. Okay, and some other um, housekeeping. So, in case you have any question for our webinar today on any other exhibit, you can simply type it in the chat box. And uh, during the presentation, we will be sh uh, showing your video. So there may be some hiccups in in case your uh, data collection is not strong enough because we're really showing high quality streaming uh, this afternoon. So it's gonna, this afternoon, this session. So it's gonna be an entertaining uh, lunch break for all of you. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to in, invite Kali, Kali, from, Kali Tang, um, senior, architects from Andrew Licking Fund to present the exhibit. Kali, over to you. Okay, hi there. Uh, I'll just share the screen then. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Yep, yeah, okay, I'll start then. Um, so my name's Carly, and I know in the poster it says Raymond's supposed to be with us today, but unfortunately uh, our uh, Raymond he's has some urgent matters he has to attend to, so I'll be taking you guys along on our, on this journey on how we approach this year's theme and the development of our installations. So if, um, going back to ALKF, uh, our first participation in the Venice Bay Annual was actually way back in 2006, where we showcased the formulated displacement, which is uh, our adaptation of scissor staircase, which is a common practice in Hong Kong's construction. And we took it uh, over to Venice to showcase to a wider audience. And that's Raymond there on the bottom right. So going back to this year's theme, redistribution, land, people, and environment. Um, we, we, our, our team really, really like this theme because of the free element of land, people, and environment. In a way, it's very similar to how we approach a project in our office where we have the land, which is the site, and then we coordinate with the people, which is the client, and together with the project team, and then we have to cater for the environment. So, so the correlation between the three elements uh, we feel is very strong and very uh, interconnected to, to, to our architectural trade. And our approach into this year's theme is to focus on the sense and the smell of the city, of how the fragrance of Hong Kong can truly reflect Hong Kong's unique built environment. In a way, we all perceive and interpret sense in a very unique way, which is often triggered by our past memories and our experiences. For example, even me or you, we may both be born in Hong Kong, but because of the different region where we grew up or the different school that we went to and the different people and experience that we encountered during our life, we could both interpret a sense, like the same sense very uniquely. And it's the sensory kind of communication that we want to bring out in our exhibit. 
So the Chinese word Hong Kong literally translates as Fragrant Harbour and it is a name that stems from the very early colonial past where uh, the instant trading uh, is, is a very strong industry in Hong Kong. So um, this is a 19th century painting illustrating the different trade ships lining along Victoria Harbour. And what's interesting about the painting is if we look at the different vessel, they're all different sizes and scale and different style. So it represents that they come from all over the world, uh, aligning to port at Victoria Harbour in Hong Kong. So following the city's rapid growth during the colonial years, the instant trading path has since died down, yet this fragrance, uh, the term fragrance still remains very closely and it's, very, it's still very relevant to the city. This sensory impact has become regional by distribution of smaller towns and districts where odors directly reflect the surrounding built environment. So we get these uh, pungent dry fishes and seafood from the street of Shenwan to the constant um, influx of incense fume and smokes coming from Wan Tai Xin uh, daily. And then from the star ferry that we all know and love, um, there's this very strong gasoline smells as we abort and alight the ferry. But in recent years, the city has gone through a drastic redistribution. Gone are these unique uh, regional trade and local businesses. And, um, and they're making way for these mega residential development consisting of stacking boxes. And this also changed the way we live as well. We live more privately now. So this kind of communal sharing um, is also dying within the city. And even um, to the lower working group, um, subdivided units are being common site. And many of them, um, it's very poor condition with no windows or view. And with the growth of the city going through such a drastic rate, um, we actually get landfill sites situated within the city itself. So the term fragrance still remains very, very much Hong Kong, yet it's it's just the smell itself are no longer as appetizing as they used to be. So we ask ourselves the question, gone are the smells, but is the city still losing its charm? Um, when we thought, um, like, um, so initially we all worked together to bring in, we, we, we all want to bring this, each and every single smell all the way to Venice. That was the initial idea. So we, uh, at the early stage, we looked into how we could collect the smell, contain the smell, transport the smell, and showcase the smell. But um, upon like really looking into the whole logistic and the feasibility of it, and, and how people from Venice might interpret the smell of dry fish, um, there might be a certain loss in translation. So we all stepped back a little bit and decided to take a more kind of, um, a symbolic approach into how we could represent the smells. So looking at the smells in the city, because the charm of Hong Kong defi definitely lies within its density, and the smell, the different odors and smell kind of weave and redistribute around the city, creating this unique aura. And it is through these alchemist-like combinations that leaves a lasting memory of Hong Kong. So we have a montage here where we are created showcasing different unique smell that we find are very unique to the city. Okay, so now we talk about the, our, our installation itself. So the aim of our installation is to illustrate the complexity in the layering of scents within the city. And the medium we've chosen is this tensile fabric. Um, it's the elastic, uh, elasticity that we really want to use to demonstrate this transition in the movement of scents and smells. So through layering and overlapping of these tensile wrapping, it allows us to form three-dimensional forms. And the eventual form that we comes up with, we decided on this organ-like composition where it is organic and active so that it reflects the ever-changing evolution of the city. We named it the seed because we believe it represents the beginning, the growth and the evolution of the city. So when we got to this stage, we have this kind of um, 
30 centimeter tall uh, mock-up model of our of our exhibit and because of our really kind of diet we really want to showcase the smell but because um, it was difficult and it wasn't really feasible we decided uh, like we, we came to a conclusion that we're missing something so we really want to introduce some movement into uh, so from the mock-up stage to the final exhibition where uh, Gassing described that we create this big uh, installation we want to add in a mechanical contraction with it so kind of give it a pulse so we kind of bring our exhibit to life and one of the problems, as we mentioned before, was the COVID-19 pandemic, the outbreak. Um, because of that, uh, or maybe because we grew so accustomed to the design being confirmed in Hong Kong, the drawing being drafted in Hong Kong, and then we send it to China to get it fabricated. Uh, we kind of, and then we couldn't anymore because of the travel ban or, or the restriction at the customer along the border. So we, so our team had to find local or skilled local uh, blacksmith or seamstress or fabricator. And it was hard. That was hard. Like together with the smell, we found that that was a dying trade in Hong Kong, the whole kind of manufacturing and fabricating. And so it took us a long time before we come up with, we, we, before we pair up with a team of fabricators that was willing to work together. And so we initially started with the carcasses, which is the steel rod, uh, which is uh, sculpted by hand. And then we went to the fabric. Um, it took a long time to choose the right fabric because our exhibit would be showcased. Initially, our exhibit is supposed to be showcased at uh, open air area. So we had to find fabric that are water repellent, um, stretchable and uh, and work with the contraction itself and but when we found that fabric what was hard was uh, how we're going to put that fabric onto the carcass itself and we were really lucky enough to come across this seamstress where she was hand uh, hand stitched stitch by stitch to put the fabric onto the carcasses so we were able to complete our installation so these are photos showcasing the finished uh, exhibit and by pulling, uh, we, we made it interactive as well. So by pulling uh, a lever to the side of the uh, post, it makes the balloon in the middle uh, expand and contract in a way pushing and stretching and morphing the fabric that showcases the whole kind of movement. And we want that to showcase the kind of the layering and the interweaving and the morphing of the smells of Hong Kong. So this is our final exhibit and we created a video to kind of wrap up the whole journey as well. This year's theme focuses on the word redistribution, land, people, and environment. The Chinese words Hong Kong literally translates to vagrant harbor, a name stemming from the city's incense trading past where aroma incense spread across the ports of Hong Kong. The incense trade has since died down, yet this sensory impact has become regional through the distribution of smaller towns and districts where its aroma directly reflects the built environment. These alchemist-like combination of fragrances interconnect to reflect the unique built environment of Hong Kong. Our installation aims to illustrate this complexity in the multi-layering of scents within the city's organ-like composition, reflecting the organic evolution of Hong Kong. The contraction gives a sense of life through the pulse-like movement, to be known as the sea, symbolically meaning the beginning and the constant evolution of the city. Okay, so that's wrap up our part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kali. But before we go on to the next video, I do have a few short questions for Kali. I hope you don't mind answering now. No problem. Yeah, I 
when seeing this exhibit, although it's called a seed, somehow I would see a human organ, like the heart or the mm. kidney, whatever. Have you guys ever thought of um, using more ex expressive color, like a red, to uh, in instead of black for the fabric? Uh, we thought about, we actually did think about using red, but um, we didn't want it to be too... Uh, we didn't want it to express kind of a very overpowering kind of uh, gesture. Um, so we decided to stick with the black. And I think the black kind of works well with, because it's, it, although it appears black, but when you look at it from different angle, when the light hits it, and when you pull on the trigger to show the construction expanding, it's actually very, it's very clear. It's very, the porosity and the layering of it actually appears kind of almost transparent like. So that's what we like about choosing that fabric. Yeah, true. In fact, I did. I did see the exhibit in in front of me. Uh, that was that was end last year, I think in 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 Minamore, in Minamore. Right. And then, uh, of course, uh, later this year, every members of the public will have the chance to see the exhibit in front of you uh, when we have a physical exhibition held in Hong Kong. So please stay tuned. One more question from me. Kali, I really enjoy um, the design concept that which sort of rooted in senses and you guys have chosen scent. Yeah. So uh, in the video, I see that you guys have put the exhibit in different places of, of Hong Kong, especially in Shenwen, uh, Central and also uh, near the harbor. Was right. there any reason for such site selection? Well, initially, we want to take it to um, everywhere that has a unique smell. Oh. And, but um, because of the sheer scale itself, like even in the photo we see, it takes about four or five people to take it everywhere. And so we spent two days taking it around places that where we actually feasibly, like initially, we really want to take it into one night scene as well. And oh, we, actually, we actually asked as well, and then we were told we couldn't. And everything was made quite difficult given the pandemic, but there's certain places that we it was very difficult to move this around anyway. So at the end of the day, we made a short itinerary and then we just did it in two days where we shoot it in places where we could actually take it. Yeah. yeah understood. Understood. So um, I will. I must say that the videos you show us were really amazing, as if they are real exhibits, especially the first one when the music uh, echoes with the um, the visual where the oh. incense, sort of the smoke, yeah, uh, comes yeah. the incense. Can we have a chance to see them on YouTube? Uh, yeah, that's actually in the AR. Um, the video is, is linked to the AR where people in Venice could click to see more and it will show the video as well, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so Kelly, if you don't mind, you can definitely share the link of the of the. That's video. sure, sure. I'll do that. I'll yeah. pass that to him. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Kelly. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. So um um, yeah, participants. Whenever you have a question, you are all free to uh, post about um on the chat box so we can uh, ask on your behalf um and hope that the exhibitors will have a chance to listen uh, to your comments and questions, okay? Yeah, so now we come to the second video prepared by CTU. So we have Louis and Polina with us. Hi, Louis, Polina, would you mind unmute yourself? Hello. Hi, hi. hi. How do you like um, uh, Andrew Lee King Fan's video? Polina, maybe you want to? Uh, well, I find it very interesting. As Louis said before, we started working together, so we have some, uh, I think, a similar point of view on uh, on uh, uh, different uh, urban processes and also on different uh, urban perceptions. And uh, yeah, actually, it's the first time I saw uh, uh, Carly your exhibit and also your video, and I find it uh, uh, actually super interesting. And I also like very much the fact that you took the exhibit to the different places and somehow introduced it to the space uh, where you have uh, uh, these different uh, uh, smells. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I like it very much. Thank yeah, you. and do we, do we? Great. No, no I, I think I would, I would second that. I thought, um, I think a lot of things we discussed are still in there somehow. And I think you'll probably see some of the things we discussed in our video as well. So you probably call us out later and we can <laughs> have a little chat about that. That'll be, that was really, 
really, really nice. And we, um, yes, yeah, so some of the early kind of uh, discussions about web, how you could bring smell, that's pretty difficult, right? So I think, and, and unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it looked like moving to the, to the tangible uh, kind of um, material fabric thing also became difficult in a different way as well. So I think it was quite challenging, but it was great you succeeded. And, uh, and um, yeah, that was great. Thank you. So in fact, both groups do, uh, do work on our senses, our senses. So um, Andrew Licking Fan's video focused on the sense of smell, whereas um, uh, CTU's video more on how we feel, yeah. So uh, I'll hand over to you, uh, Louis and Polina, presenting your video, okay? Okay, um, yeah, I'm gonna just show the video. It's about five minutes long. Um, how will they start? The idea, it's called Hong Kong via Venice. And the original idea was to um, actually show the video in, in, in Venice uh, with uh, part, it's, it's not, the, whole, the video is not the whole um, installation. It also has some chairs, which uh, of course never went there because it's now virtual. And the chairs were chairs that are found chairs uh, from the streets of Hong Kong. And the idea was to bring um, some of the uh, experiences of Hong Kong to Venice. And the idea of the video was inviting, and you'll see it's set up to invite um, visitors to the exhibition in Venice to then go out back into the city and find the equivalent smells, tastes, sights, sounds, etc. that they see in the video. Um, that have been captured in Hong Kong to find the equivalent of those in Venice if they can and then to capture them uh, probably videos or photographs and put them on our Instagram. Now unfortunately of course this didn't quite happen so I know the site specificity of um, the installation the nature of the site specificness has changed but uh, hopefully when it does come back to the physical show then we can do something similar but slightly shift the invitation so the invitation the one you'll see now was uh, supposed to go to venice and it's uh, framed in that way but at the same time i think it talks about it, it tries to compare and contrast hong kong and venice as we thought about that there were many more i would say there was uh, quite a lot of resonance between hong kong and venice historically uh as well as physically. Physically, there's a bit of a contrast and uh, um, uh, both a contrast and uh, uh, similarities as well. Um, there's water, obviously, but Venice has no mountains, it's as flat as you like. Um, but there's there's a lot of, there's something about those, both of them being kind of great port cities in their age. You know, Venice, uh, almost a thousand years ago, uh, Hong Kong much more recently, but it has that kind of, um, we're just cool we don't care about you kind of feeling you know we're just who we are we just get a, 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 along and do our stuff you know and i think if you read uh, um historical accounts venice or even accounts of being in venice or have you been there then venice is probably quite different now i imagine but um um there's a sort of we don't really mind we are just minding our business and you think we're beautiful but we're just doing our stuff and, and i think that that is uh, you'll see in the, the 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 little um video um, the idea after the video will present uh, uh, then um, uh, a short, well, short. I hope it's short. PowerPoint that tries to unpack some of the other layers within that video. So let me just uh, try and get the video going now. Uh, let's share screen. Uh, whoops! Wait a minute. Two seconds. I just have to get that up, and then I try and share screen. Okay. Okay, uh, unfortunately it doesn't quite do that. Let me share the screen first and then I'll put the video on. Can you see the black screen? Is that working? It's black, so it should work yes, now, yes. okay. Two mythic trading capitals. One floats on water, the other on land reclaimed from the sea. Fabulously wealthy, but where most resources go to a few, many more have very little. Space, peace and quiet, rest, a cool place to sit, even happiness.
summer in Hong Kong. We escape into the cool indoors. The air conditioner is a machine designed to redistribute thermal comfort, but only to those inside. In the alleyways of this city, on the streets where the waste pickers toil, air conditioners stir the stagnant air with their dragon breath. The old chair, taken from his apartment, was placed in the station by the bus driver for rest between shifts. Other drivers bring other chairs. They do not mind others sitting on those chairs. The woman from the laundry donates a chair too. Once in the street, where many people wait for a bus, such chairs become common property of all who pass by. Objects associated with human bodies evoke them, and especially their absence. On Hong Kong's humid and frenetic streets, tired chairs from elsewhere inhabit quiet corners. In Venice, before bridges, every island was a semi-autonomous parish centred on its campo and to which access was limited. But city-wide needs of survival and commerce required more efficient cross-city movement. Accessibility is a public good. This led to the first bridges creating a city-wide network for more efficient movement and redistributing accessibility more equitably amongst all Venetians. Hong Kong's air conditioner, on the other hand, is a device that privatizes the benefit of thermal comfort, resulting in its less equitable distribution amongst all Hong Kongers. Architectural configurations redistribute benefits of cities to citizens. In Hong Kong, the Western District cargo working area is still a workplace in the day. In the evening, it is a place where Hong Kong does what it does best. Do-it-yourself urbanism. No one claims this space, but all share it. All recognize its publicness. Do-it-yourself redistributions are very Hong Kong. They are a defining feature of the city's public spaces. Through it, we see past impassive officialdom to a gruff compassion that makes life tolerable in a tough and inequitable city. Explore Hong Kong with us by looking at Venice with new eyes. How is design a technology of redistribution? This happens at every scale. Those who know one or both cities may recognize these moments and perhaps see Hong Kong mirrored in Venice.
So, um, please do scan that and you can uh, join us on Instagram and please contribute as well uh, your images of Hong Kong, um, anything on the streets of Hong Kong um, that show us how, how you know, you think design can make a difference. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now. Uh, let me see if we can do this. Yeah, because if I can add something, this uh, uh, way to use Instagram is also the way to uh, to share your ways of re redistributing the uh, the design in the city. And uh, this is also one of our aims to uh, to see the way how people they redistribute the design and how do they share it uh, through uh, uh, their photos or uh, or short videos. Okay, so let me try and go on to the slideshow. And it deliberately doesn't have a title because it's a continuation of Hong Kong. Uh, Paulina, I'm going to speak, but if you want to just jump in, uh, sure, please sure. just no jump problem. in at any time. Uh, Louis, um, just be careful with your microphone. Ah, yes, yes. Enough. Okay, got that. Um, so um, we thought we would jump straight. Uh, was, I was very excited to hear, to see this uh, the the um, redistribution as, as a theme and um, because that's what we work on quite a lot uh, I've been working on uh, in both in my teaching as well as in uh, in the research um, and so a lot of that stuff you saw in the video is really observations that we've been making for some time now about what the built environment uh, can do and built environment design particularly so as you saw in the video um, uh, air conditioners can be seen as, oh, well, it's just cool me down, right? But actually it's a device for redistributing the benefits of thermal comfort to different urban dwellers. Um, if we chose to design our buildings in a different way, we may not uh, need so much aircon. And if we don't, then we do need more aircon. So it's really uh, uh, um, something that is, uh, uh, the use of the air conditioner is really a, a, a design uh, decision. Um, so designer, designable urban elements and complex relationships between those elements distribute the benefits of cities to citizens. So if you're standing out here, you're going to get feel even much hotter than you are, um, and certainly much hotter than if you were inside the building. Um, here's a, another example. This is in Macau. Um, so if you're living in one of those apartments in Macau, you're expanding your private space. You're making these cages and then you're kind of extending the cage, you put your flower pots and it's bigger and bigger and bigger. So what's happening is that the house owners or the flat owners are increasing uh, private benefits for themselves, private value, right? Uh, what happens in the street then is that you get this, uh, uh, these balconies sticking out and you're taking away light from the street, if you like. So you can argue that it's reducing uh, then the public, well, what should be uh, um, a public good, which is light, which isn't really a public good because it can be taken away, as you see. Um, so I was down there saying, hmm, this is bad, you know, these people are kind of making the flats bigger and bigger, and then it starts to rain. And then I thought, oh, great, I can now shelter. So what is really interesting is that the same uh, physical configuration can have different values, can be good or bad, depending on the context. And I think that some, goes something to, uh, goes to the heart of what how designers ought to be thinking about design. And that's what um, our work is about, really. Um, at a different scale, this is London, um, and it's a place called Walworth Road. So the left, two, the two pictures on the left are the before and the two pictures on the right are after. If you look a little bit carefully, the picture on the left, there are four lanes of vehicular traffic, and actually two of the lanes, you can see here, not that clearly, is a bus lane. You can see here very clearly. So two bus lanes, and two um, other traffic lanes. And this is in a part of London where there is no tube, there's no MTR or a metro. Uh, so they rely a lot on buses. So the speed of bus movement is really quite important to get people down that road to out to the south, uh, southeast of London. And you'll see that the, the, it's uh, quite grotty, quite, um, and quite narrow, paved, relatively narrow pavements for London. And it's quite a poor part of London. If you look on, I think the Walworth Road, no, it's not the Old Road, it's Old Kent Road is on the Monop Monopoly board, right? It's the poorest one, but Walworth Road is very close to the Old Kent Road. So you get the idea, it's a poor part of London. There's not much, uh, not very well served by public transport, quite nasty, full of traffic. 
And what happened was um, there was some work done by, tra by Transport for London to say, uh, what can we do to improve the bus speed and make the whole street nicer? And then they, someone proposed actually taking away two lanes, of the, taking with the bus lanes, that means reducing the carriageway by half and making therefore the pavement wider, as you can see here. And when they first did the modeling, they found, hey, the buses are actually going faster with half the amount of carriageway. How can that be possible? Right. So they did the modeling again, and that was the case. And how they did this was they, although they took away the bus lane, they put in bus gates at the junction. So every time there was a, a, um, a red light, the bus could overtake the cars. So that's how the buses got faster. Yeah. And so they built it. So what happened here was that the buses did get faster. Not only that, they got better, much wider pavement for the uh, pedestrians. They took away the bus lane, and the bus lane used to be clogged up by lots of illegal people stopping, park car stopping. So that's why it got clogged up. So counterintuitively, a clever bit of design which uh, widens the um, pedestrian footway and narrowed, narrowed the carriageway counterintuitively made the buses go faster. So in a way, it was a win for the pedestrians and a win for the public transport. Maybe not such a big win if you were a private car driver, right? But think about how design has worked there. It didn't take away something and give something that something to somebody else. It wasn't a, a, a zero sum game. It was a win-win situation. And if a design can do that, and it did do that here in a very complex system, you know, we're talking about the whole uh, traffic network, then how can it do that in architecture? How can it do that in urban design? How does it work at different scales? Um, you all, probably most of you being architects and designers know this picture. This is of course, Central Park, New York and Manhattan. And originally, um, the, uh, the grid of Manhattan was laid out in the 19th century with no park. It was full grid and it was all about selling pieces of land and then uh, getting developed and making money from selling developable land. And at some point, um, people, the, uh, the good leaders of New York went off to um, the uh, Europe and say, hey, all the great European cities have parks, you know, uh, we want a park too. So that's what they did. They laid out Central Parks, massive, right? And of course, they, what that meant was they couldn't sell this land for, uh, for, for development. Um, but what's really amazing and surprising, and actually not that surprising, is now Central Park creates a huge amount of public value. Everyone can use the park. It, it's kind of, um, it's a place for rest, for relaxing. But what's totally amazing as well is that the private property values around the park is actually much greater than if the park was not there. So again, it's a win-win situation as well. And I don't know if the, um, the, the founding fathers were, you know, were thinking about that, but that's what's happened. So if we can come up, if these urban designers and planners who are also designers too, uh, come up with solutions uh, that distribute value in this way, it doesn't mean that, it, it certainly doesn't mean value uh, being a zero sum game. You can actually have win, win and win if you were clever enough about your design. Um, so, and then finally at a much larger scale, city region scale, this is Paris. And this is something that's ongoing now. It's called the Grand Paris Express. And you'll see here's a map of uh, um, actually greater Paris. And this is the heart of Paris. Um, and what you'll see here, the red is the other poorest areas. I think it stands for, um, well, it's basically high unemployment and quite high deprivation, that north uh, east side of Paris. And, and if you see here, this is what's being built currently in, in Paris. It's actually called, the, um, they are actually joining up a lot of existing rail stations uh, around the center of Paris and in some buildings some new ones to create two continuous loops. They are interlocking loops. Imagine two Olympic rings, okay? They're not concentric loops that most, in most cities, uh, uh, the metro system is concentric loops going out, but this one is two over, uh, overlapping loops, uh, uh, interlocking loops. And the idea of this is to try and redistribute accessibility, which is quite poor. The orbital accessibility is quite poor on that edge, uh, around the edge of the Paris. Excuse me, Louis, your, your mic is, is oh, sorry. putting yes. some sound. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah. Can you repeat so, the last bit? Yeah, yeah. so the idea here is that the, the location of and the shape, the design, the shape, the configuration of those, that ex the loop is designed to redistribute accessibility, which is quite poor. In that part of, um, of Paris, so people can't get to jobs and, and, and amenities and so on so easily. Um, make that accessibility much better. So it's being recognised, and there's lots of work done on it now. That accessibility is 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 a good that should be shared equitably. So uh, um, so that becomes uh, 
So a question for us who work in cities, whether we're designing a chair, a public seating, or a building, or a street, or a neighborhood, or even entire new towns, who gets to benef benefit and who doesn't? And I think designing can be seen as an act of benefit redistribution in the city. I think I've shown that. Um, and so there, I think design has a huge responsibility uh, in that. And I, I think uh, speaking, I think most of you might be designers. I think I would, uh, that's a very big point and that's the big takeaway, I think. Um, that it, this is half about halfway through a presentation. Do you want me to go on or do you want to go? To, uh, I think you have time, right? Yeah, okay. We have time. Go on. Okay, so I'm going to go. So, if design is a technology of redistribution of the benefits of what the cities offer, um, then you can think about the city as a place where citizens can, in theory anyway, access jobs, markets, and wages, etc. So, here's something from the OECD Why is a city there? You know, why is there a city in the first place? Well, we have agglomeration benefits and disbenefits. Agglomerations means kind of clumping together, okay? Uh, and what we get in the city is lots of people living close together. And when you do that, you've got benefits, as you can see down here. Um, you've, you have access. If you live in the city, you have clo uh, um, huge access, much better access to markets, to amenities, to public transport, to jobs, and to wages. But when you stick a lot of people close together, and, and Carly mentioned uh, um, uh, density, uh, all cities are, of course, much more dense than non-cities, but of course, Hong Kong is denser than most other cities as well. You've got, uh, in, then you've got impact on rising house prices, congestion, pollution, crime, and inequality. So that's, those are the costs of sticking closely together, right? And if you have those two things together, um, so a city can be thought about, conceptualizes agglomeration of opportunities for person-person, person-thing and person-space encounters or interactions it is through these encounters and interactions that benefits that can that uh, arise in the city of being close together can uh, are consumed, and therefore the values can be realized. Okay, by the participants. Um, but of course, because we all sit close together, we've got wages, jobs, public transport, etc. But we also have rising crime, pollution, congestion, house prices, or many of which we know about. Maybe not so much crime in Hong Kong, but all, certainly all the other things. Okay, so when what we need to do in cities is to create trade offs. We have to make trade offs. When we move to the city, we have to give up our nice big garden, right, and nice fresh air, um, and we all make those choices. But as people come together, we have to organize those choice making as well. We have to organize our built environment to enable the best kind of trade-offs, okay? So um, that redistribution of costs and benefits between people and places are shaped by design, very much so, as I've shown in the last few slides. So I think that gives us somehow a background of what the context that we are all built environment uh, designers, especially those in cities are, are working in, okay? So design being the technology of redistribution and urban and architectural design configurations are important, almost critical means for doing this redistribution. And then this happens at every scale. So this is just giving some background to the pictures I showed earlier, right? But in Hong Kong's apparently messy streets, oh, it's full of these. I went back and took another photograph where there was nothing there. So I wonder if he was a ghost, you know, it was quite, quite nice to see that sometimes. Um, is there a role for design in our messy streets in Hong Kong? Uh, here's another really nice example, I would say. Uh, so these chairs placed out in the in the public realm, I think I would, we could say they're accidental. How do they get there? Why are they there? And are they acts of design? I don't know. Um, and that's a question I want to ask all of you. Um, this is just on Queens Road West, uh, walking around with my students. And this is a um, just a laundrette, as you can see. And I think every day they put out these. Um, and of course it's for their enjoyment, but it's for the customer's enjoyment, but it's for everybody's enjoyment as well. So somehow your um, the accidental benefits uh, start occurring as uh, also, these are positive benefits. You can also have negative benefits as I showed about the, uh, with the um, Macau balconies as well. Um, all this happens all the time. So everything that we do, uh, whether we're designers or not can have impacts on other people. In this case, it's a, a positive one. Um, and then we have all these un unintended redistribution in the city. So improvisational everyday redistributions in Hong Kong take place in the accidental spaces left over after officially permitted design. But of course we know officially permitted design is not the only kind. This is in uh, Samsung Bowl. Uh, and this guy was just sitting there uh, it's a kind of safe place just behind the barrier under the tree reading and this woman was sitting on then using then, uh, uh, that uh, barrier to sit and chat to him 
Um, you see this kind of stuff all over the place in Hong Kong, right? So the private chairs that are retired in public spaces that offer rest. And then you've got the very precisely set up base sorting area of, of cardboard grannies in the crook of the traffic railings. You often see that as well, I don't have a picture, but you know what I mean. They will find the sheltered spaces to organize their cardboard um, or, to um, or the release from the oppression of city life that takes place every afternoon and evening in the working cargo pier, which you saw, the Western District cargo working area, which is no longer there. Um, and to which the nanny state for a long time was turning a blind eye. Uh, they were not stopping people from going there, although it was not actually legal for us to go there. Okay, So all these apparently undesigned redistributions are ubiquitous and remain a defining feature of Hong Kong's public spaces. I think that's what the heart of the film was about. But what I want to say is to, to think, say, are they really undesigned? And I want to show you, these are images that you all know really, really well, and you probably um, are familiar with, uh, have thought about this. If you're an architect, you might have thought about this too. So this is work by a student of mine uh, some time ago at HKU, and he actually analyzed the precision, absolute precision by which these apparently messy stalls are lined up. Everything from the sight lines to the private quiet corner where the stall holder could eat their lunch to exactly how fat their fattest customer was to be able to get into one of these spaces, right? So, and also, you know, how these uh, shelters maybe were there to protect the goods, but also protect the customers from the sun. So all of these, you can see this all the time in, in, in Hong Kong, the impacts of these accidental design, perhaps. Um, and this is from another student, I forgot to put his name down, um, but another student who actually then studied. If you look at this mess that you see in Hong Kong, these, these messy back lanes, the piles of cardboard, the sorting of rubbish and all of that, actually all these people have what they call base sorting stations, uh, the, the cardboard grannies in the street, okay? They're recyclers. And without them, we wouldn't have a city that works. If you stopped recycling for, or this waste collection for just one day, you're gonna have mountains of rubbish in central. Just city couldn't function without them. Okay, they're part of, they're very much part of the, serv the critical service they provide our city. Um, and so here you are seeing that, you know, they have a very precise selection of this place in the back lane, which faces a bit where you can see out um, this particular seat. And I didn't, she, it's not very clearly shown here, but all, a lot of these people have even much narrower space and the exact location where they power, which kind of cardboard, where they tie up the le leftover strings, which they will reuse the next day, is very precisely laid out in each of these corners. So it is not undesigned at all. It's very precisely designed, but um, actually unofficially designed. And all of that is allowable because um, the government actually uh, doesn't, uh, strictly enforce these too much and allows this other world to happen, which gives us all the other kinds of things that we get in our city, which gives us the sensory delight actually of Hong Kong, including the smells. Okay. Uh, they sometimes police the smells, I think, Kali, but um, um, uh, not always too much, right? Hard to police as well, the smells. So because cities and Hong Kong particularly can be hard places to make a living in and, and to live, as you can see here, design by these people, designed by these citizens, designed by the workers as a way of eking out what few resources are available. Because if you didn't design, you wouldn't have those resources, I think. And precise design has always been needed. But I think the question to the professional designers is how do these designs take care of others? And should our design take care of others? So how does spatial and architectural design deliver or withhold compassion? Compassionate, compassionate leakage, you know, of benefits for those in society. And shouldn't be leakage. We should be sharing them much more consciously, right? Uh, street cleaners, waste pickers, the elderly, the economically marginalized and low wage workers. And these are some pictures of how um, these people live. Um, and I want to end by talking, uh, by uh, taking a quote from Herbert Simon, who is actually a great design theorist, although I think he was a Nobel, Nobel laureate for economics, or the, uh, but he's a design theorist. Uh, we, we, we see him as such today. He says, to design is to devise courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. He doesn't talk about buildings. He doesn't talk about architecture. He doesn't talk about graphic design or product design. He talks about courses of action to change, to make things better, to make situations better. And if we don't remember that, as our calling as designers, I think we might be missing something. So my question is, what are our responsibilities as designers, all kinds of designers? 
And my last question is to architects. Is the answer always a building? That's it. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. I hope that you can keep the, this sli last slide on. Okay. Yeah, and so Polina, be before I ask questions, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, well, I think that uh, what is uh, like uh, uh, very important in uh, uh, in all this way, uh, how we were realizing the uh, uh, our exhibit, the video mainly, and also in our way of thinking, is that uh, uh, in all this uh, uh, thinking about the design and the, uh, and uh, the redistribution of the design. Uh, uh, our message somehow was also to say to people that everybody has the responsibility in using the city and everybody somehow is uh, uh, on the smaller or bigger scale, but uh, designing the space uh, by the way how he or she is using the space and uh, the way how we use the space is also uh, the way how the design is redistributed. So the design uh, uh, that was made by professionals, how it is after redistributed by, uh, by the users uh, and uh, also how the users, uh, they, uh, let's say, develop this design, they um, adapt this design or, uh, or upgrade this design uh, to their needs and uh, to the way how, uh, how, we, how they use the space, how they want to use the space or how they need to use the space. And uh, uh, then I think in our approach uh, to, uh, uh, to this topic of different senses, uh, we weren't creating, as you could see uh, uh, in our video in the Louis presentation, we weren't creating uh, any exhibit uh, or exhibits, but we were looking for the exhibits in the city, the, uh, the elements of the city that could uh, uh, show us how the people, they redistribute the, the design, how they use the design and uh, how these different elements could be used as exhibits to illustrate our, uh, uh, our ideas about this redistribution of the design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paulina, for your sharing. So I can see that, and in your works, you you guys do touch on um, the more sort of a basic um, of the concept of design. So why do we design, and is is Hong Kong having design done in a in the right way, where every person, every people of the city enjoy the same sort of benefits? Yeah, can can I see that way, Louis? Um, yeah, I think I think every every uh, there is no uh, the thing about design is that there's no one optimum answer, right? There are multiple optimums. So I think as I feel that as designers, and obviously because we also teach designers as well, young designers, um, the, uh, is always to remind ourselves to think always step back from the actual design task. Design tasks tend to be very can be very particular, very minuscule, very all consuming, but always to step back and see what, how does our design affect other people? And architecture is big, you know, architecture is not a small thing, it's massive. So, you know, think about the way that the, build, the, the water falls of your building and hits, hits the, you know, hits the guy on, on tall buildings, you know, creates a turbulence, right? So whose umbrellas are being broken, you know, at the bottom of your skyscraper? Um, of course, we, I, I'm not saying they're not to have skyscrapers, but what uh, actions do you take and you can design that in to minimize that sort of thing and to think um, much more holistically. And I, I think also it's not just about uh, the design of buildings as well. We need to be thinking how we design the system, uh, the, I would say the systems that, uh, I would say the regulatory systems that uh, uh, control or affect the way we design. And in Hong Kong, because everything's so tight, the regulatory system is very, is also very precise. But I, I do think that we could improve the design of those systems to ensure that the people who do the actual building design can then, are then asked to look at the bigger picture as well. And I think that quite isn't quite there. And I would say um, lots of, lots of departments every department that has a finger in the design pie in, in the hong kong government would be i would say that would be land that would be planning and that would be building as well right uh, yeah. uh, uh have to think about how they're designing the systems they they are uh, that uh, control physical configurational shaping 
Um, so design doesn't just stop at the physical and the tangible, it goes all the way back into uh, the design of policies, the design of systems and so on. And this is not something I've invented, obviously. This is a, this is a massive area of uh, a work out there now going on. Um, for the last, I would say, uh, 10, maybe even 20 years uh, on this matter. And especially on the design, design of policy is, is quite a hot topic. It's been around, especially in Europe, big thing um, for maybe 10 years or so. So I think we need to think about that. And I think there are lots of designers. And the thing is, we always think, oh, we are designers, architects are designers, but no, all those policymakers are also designers too. And planners are designers too. And citizens as well. Yeah, definitely. Yep, so um, yeah, I you have a question, Louis, how, and Paulina, how have you guys and uh, made the footage for Venice because of the travel ban? I mean, under the, under the travel ban, how have you guys managed to, to, to do that? Uh, well, we had, uh, we had a team member who unfortunately had to leave our team uh, for some professional reasons, who, uh, who is an original uh, Venetian and who last summer went to Venice and who was able to, uh, to take the videos and uh, photos for us. Wow, excellent, excellent, so cool, as if it is just next to us, yeah. uh, with, with the place. I had better say this now because we don't have, unfortunately, we didn't manage to, uh, I don't know why, but put uh, the credits onto this, but we have a website where the credits are on this, but basically it's not just me and Paulina, although we are now here, but we have a team, uh, we have a Scylla team, uh, um, uh, Leo, who is back in, in, in mainland China currently, he did a lot of footage, led all of that, and then we have Bertram and, and Jason also who helped uh, with getting the footage in, and Mirna is the person who was, uh, who was out there in Venice for us. And also, um, I mustn't forget Chris Norman of Ginger Cat Media, who helped us really sort out that video, because we are, we're all, uh, well, I'm a novice, uh, and he really uh, helped us a lot. So just to yeah. throw that in there. Yeah, so somehow we can see that the pandemic, uh, uh, the issue if, with pandemic for, for our idea was we really wanted to have it much more inter uh, interactive between both places. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, uh, this part didn't happen. So we did our best to get uh, at least the videos and uh, uh, and photos uh, uh, from Venice, and uh, to, uh, uh, to to try to find uh, similarities by ourselves uh, instead of asking people to uh, 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 to find these similarities. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Louis and Polina. So, um, Kali, after watching. Do we and Polina's video, do you have any thing you want to share? Um, yeah, yeah, actually it's the first time we saw the video. Well, I, I saw, I, and um, a lot of the early kind of discussion that we had, uh, we could see, I could see that still pull through. And, and I really like that. And in a way you kind of did bring Hong Kong to Venice in the co comparison. And so, yeah, it was really interesting to see that, like how we all started as a group and then we all, it, it, we all spore off and did our own thing, but then they kind of accompany each other quite well. So, so it, that was really interesting from yeah. our point of view, yeah. Yeah, then another tougher question, Kali. So as you can see on the screen, Louis raised a question. What are our responsibilities as designers? <laughs> so what do you think as an architect, a practicing architect, what do you think? Well, um, like, uh, in a way, Louis kind of answered the question as well, because there's the policymaker, there's everyone around it. And there's this quote that I always really like when I was studying architecture. It's um, everything's architecture and everyone could be an architect. So, so I guess the answer to that would be is no, it doesn't have to be a building, but it's all the kind of little role that everyone plays that comes to the most suitable solution. So it's never about the most pretty or or, or, or the best selling or the most uh, economical. It's always about finding that suitable balance. And I think everyone could play a role into that, um, whether you're a policymaker, whether you're up at the top of the pyramid or you're one of the ci uh, citizen or stakeholder. So I think it's trying to get that balance between that mapping of the society to derive the most suitable solution. So I guess, yeah, I try my best to answer that, yeah. <laughs> great, this is such a great lesson today, having two exhibits uh, share with all of you, so including The Seed by Andrew Lee King Fan. Of course, we have Kali representing the firm, and also uh, we have the video, um, Hong Kong via Venice, right? <laughs> yeah. 
by CDU, so rep represented by Louis and also Polina. Yeah, I, I think they would be, that would be, that would mark a, a beautiful end to our discussion and sharing today. And so um, for anyone who are interested in the videos and also um, the news of the Venus Biennale Hong Kong Collateral Event, which is titled Redistribution, Land, People, Environment, please stay tuned um, and go to our website and you can definitely be able to find the access to the videos that we just shared today. Yeah, so without, um, yeah, as we don't see any questions here, but we, we do see, we do see um, uh, comments by Denise Ho. She said that I believe designers in the new paradigm of constantly changing urbanization, cultural lifestyle and technology have a social responsibility. Yeah, we have to, um, I mean, not just design, but really to uh, have in our shoulders, sharing some burden of, of the society to make our life better, not only beautiful or functional. So architects' roles are changing and we need to be educated to overlap with other disciplines to create spaces with purposes. Yeah, I, I think Dennis really said it well. Yeah, so um, yeah, as we don't have any other questions and comments, so I guess we would put an end to the webinar here today. Yeah, and there, so, there's a question. Uh, oh yeah. Asked. Okay, okay. So, uh, by way, how to balance design and construction? How to balance design and construction? So it seems that uh, Wang is denying construction being a design, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's a good question, Carly. Maybe you can answer that. If uh, <laughs> you are the only one who's designing buildings, right? Um, well, like I said before, with the um it's, it's always trying to find that balance i mean um like i'm not like uh it'd be naive to say that everything that's get constructed is perfect it's not and it's that whole process from having the design stage where the involvement would be the architect and then you get the client and then the product team but then when the construction there's a there's more people coming into the dialogue so you get the contractor you get the different uh different uh departments so it's about everyone playing their role and then and then finding that balance to, to derive the most so 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 from the design to the construction stage we already got the extra input from the contractor um and the subcontractor so they, they have the expertise that they bring in and then when we submit the salary plan we go through different departments and then they have their respective expert from there giving us advice on what can or cannot be built and then uh the architect's role would be trying to find all the balance within the possibility so so i think it's not a comparison between design or construction i think it's from designing leading on to construction i think that would be a better say yeah and of course during construction day is also design exactly exactly yeah say. so yeah in, in those discussions you're having those guys also become your co-designers for that you know you don't think about them as designers but they are they are also co-designers right because they end up shaping uh, what, yeah, exactly. what comes out at the end. And so everybody should have some design training or some design yeah. education. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah, I think it's a kind of world, I think it's a, a lifelong education goal that we should all have, right? Should be aware. And also, um, is uh, someone earlier, Dennis Ho, had said, yeah, uh, you Dennis, know, yeah. uh, functional and beautiful, but we also have to continue for it to be, it needs to continue being beautiful and functional as well, um, as well as yeah, everything else. So, yeah. And I think also that somehow also the user after they evaluate the, uh, uh, the design, the final product, and they, ev they evaluate if this balance uh, uh, was uh, was made, was achieved uh, or not. And I think uh, not forgetting the user is also very important in, uh, in all this process of uh, both uh, design and construction. Yeah, great. So any last words from Kali, Louis and Polina? No? Uh, yeah, you have, you, you have uh, share with us what you think. Okay, so then I guess this will mark the end of um, our webinar today. Yeah, and um, yeah, I wish you all have a great summer. And I mean, I mean, I can still feel the, um, the temperature as uh, shown in um, Louis video. Mm -hmm and hoping that we can all enjoy comfort and of course 
I could not get away from the smell from the gasoline ferry as shown by the seat video. Okay, so thanks very much. And I really enjoyed the two entertaining products and presentation. And I hope every one of you who are participating in this webinar has taken something away, away with them today. Yep, so have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.